This is part 3 in a series of videos about the history and gameplay of the Magical Drop series of games. If you haven't seen the previous parts, please check it out as some context in those videos may enhance your viewing here. With that out of the way, please enjoy the video. Now is the time. Now we arrive at Data East Magnum Opus, their swan song of a game before they shut down game development for arcades. Magical Drop 3 released in 1997 in arcades and once again on the Neo Geo console. And this was Data East's final arcade game, as any games after were only on consoles. The development team for Magical Drop 3 was far larger than the previous games, with many developers returning from Magical Drop 2. Starting off, we have Naomi Sousa as producer this time. It's possible her role as supervisor slash manager was more or less producer in the previous games. But this is how it's listed here in 3. Saungu Karagiri returns as planner. Tak H once again makes a return as programmer with newcomers H Pokanyan and M Saika. A lot more graphic designers this time with Rie Sakurai, S Takeuchi, and Hiroshi Hachiya all returning as graphic designers, with newcomers N. Shizizuka, S. Nishiwaki, Okakumi, I. Seta, H. Hashimoto, Y. Kahu, and a surprising return from Magical Drop 1 by Beauty Arakawa, now listed as Tomoyuki Arakawa. For sound design and music, we have both Masaki Iwasaki and Maro making a return with NMRTK. All of them are from Gamadelic. And a SIN in all caps is also listed. For the voice cast of characters, the credits do not list who voiced what, but with some research on a wonderful fan site on Magical Drop 3, I was able to find what I needed. Quite a few voice actors return to reprise their roles. And since there are so many, I will also be using this opportunity to list the characters along with their voice actors. And holy crap, is this a lot of voice actors. So please bear with me as I go down the list. Firstly, the returning actors being Rie Sakurai for the lovely Empress, Eri Tanaka for the Fool and the Devil, Mitsuyo Tsunada, continuing her role as the Star, Ring Ring doing Justice again, Gorilla doing Strength again, Though in this entry of Magical Drop, Strength is renamed as Father Strength. More on that later. Kumiko Oka once again returns as Black Puro. And lastly, Eriko Kodaira, as both the High Priestess and the World, also returns. The rest of the cast is covered by new voice actors, especially since this entry has many more characters than the previous games. And it seems the Magician and the Chariot once again have new voice actors. For the Magician, we have Yuichi Nagashima, an old stage name for a Shiguro Nagashima, whose new stage name is now Cho. He has done many roles like Brook from One Piece, and even Gollum in the Japanese dub of Lord of the Rings. Fumuhiko Tachiki voices the Hermit and the Emperor. He has also done many roles like Kenpachi Zaraki from Bleach, and is a well-known narrator for anime like Jintama. And D. Greyman, on top of being an announcer, for games like Persona 4 Arena. He's also Laxeus from Kingdom Hearts 2. The returning character, the Chariot, and the new characters, the Hangman and the Hierophant, are voiced by Takehito Koyasu, who seems to really have a sense of style. Why? Because this guy is Dio Brando from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, if you've ever watched that. 
and even stars as the antagonist of one of my favorite games, Thakri Profile, among many, many anime and video games. The new characters, The Lovers and Death, are voiced by Haruna Ikazawa, who has also done roles like Hiroka Haruna from Hantaro and Sergeant Frog, with her voice actor group More Peach Summer Snow. She is also the Japanese voice for Coco Bandicoot and Athena from The King of Fighters. The new characters, Daughter Strength, The Sun, and The Moon, are voiced by Sumugi Osawa. More new characters, Judgment, Temperance, and The Wheel of Fortune, or as I'll be calling her from here on out, Just Fortune, are voiced by Mina Tominaga, a stage name for Yoshiko Masumoto, who had done many roles for anime like Katsuno Isono from Sazaya-san, as well as Mika and Catherine from one of my favorite Sega CD games, Snatcher. And even dubbed Babs Bunny in Tiny Toons. Lastly, we have The Tower, voiced by Zaku. So yes, many developers this time, and many voice actors for what is considered the best Magical Drop game, and my absolute favorite of the series. This is by far the most refined version of the gameplay systems and mechanics that the series has developed, and unfortunately was never matched again after. So like you had heard me list, many more characters joined the roster. We have all of the returning cast from previous games, but with the addition of all the new characters. And now finally reaches all 22 of the major arcana in a deck of tarot cards. Excluding Black Perot and the fact that there are two characters representing strength, father strength, and daughter strength. The Empress is no longer the main antagonist of this game, is that we have Fortune, who while not as completely unfair and brutal as the Empress, is still a pretty tough challenge. So moving on to the new changes and mechanics of the game, special balloons that are the same color as normal balloons can now be grabbed together. So you can actually grab a star-shaped blue special balloon with a normal blue balloon, unlike the previous game. Another new change is that there are now predefined ice balloons that already have a predetermined color in them. I mentioned a few things back in the introduction part of this series in regards to Magical Drop 3 but I'll be doing a much more comprehensive look into all of it. Firstly, they now added a button dedicated to dropping a line of balloons on the ceiling of your board. In Magical Drop 2, there can definitely be moments where you clear the board very quickly, which would amount to waiting a couple seconds before the next line of balloons drop. But this limited your combo potential since less balloons would be on screen. Now with a button to drop a row of balloons on command, you can play even more aggressively than ever before especially when you already have a good feel of comboing and pattern sight rating. This allows for huge and sometimes unstoppable combos to occur. But that's if you already are very proficient with the game. I rarely get a chance to really utilize this though, with my own skill level. But, watching higher level players take advantage of this new mechanic really shows off just how much higher the skill ceiling can go. One of the most defining and fun changes to the system is that now each and every character has balloon drop patterns all coming in different shapes and arrangements. Whereas before, the differences between characters were only really color pattern arrangements. Now, these drops on your opponent have defining shapes and characteristics. One commonly used example is of the High Priestess, where her second and second last columns of balloons have a fang-shaped pattern when she accomplishes a combo on her opponent's board. Essentially, two prongs sticking out the bottom of any combo she manages to dish out. This changes how the player and their opponent approach every battle, since now each character on the roster has a different drop pattern that has different shapes and color arrangements. The Empress, for example, has drop patterns that fall on the far leftmost side, while the world does the same, but with the rightmost side. And characters like the Sun do drop patterns shaped towards the center, like a knife. Other characters though, like the Fool and the Devil, have flat straightforward patterns similar to the previous Magical Drop games. This all drastically alters the core game in a way that makes what character you play as very important, and further solidifies Magical Drop as a competitive game. Since the characters have drop patterns now, a closer look to the chaining system reveals an interesting change to how players play the game, and that is the ability to manage the shape your selected character throws at your opponent. 
as you can see in the example here, we have of Judgment. Her drop pattern creates a kind of knife shape down on her opponent, towards the center. But by the sixth row, her pattern becomes completely flat. Doing a chain of balloon combos of up to four will start dropping that shape. So any chain higher will cause her drop shape to remain flat against her opponent. A single chain will cause one or two rows to drop depending on your character. A two chain is four rows, three chain is five rows, four chain is six rows, and it continues like that the higher it gets. In the introduction, I had also mentioned how there was an advantage to both causing a short chain and a long chain combo against your opponent. Character drop patterns are up to 8 rows long, with the 8th line drop repeating if the combo continues beyond that. Going back to the character judgment, like I had said before, her drop pattern is a knife-like shape when she does a drop. But by the 6th row, her drop becomes flat across the rows and will continue to be flat with any combo that hits a 4 chain or higher. What this means is that if you want to continue causing the center point of your opponent's board to drop, you will need to simply do multiple 2 to 3 chain combos instead, carefully timing them as not to cause a flat drop with a long chain above 3. This encourages multiple short chains for anyone who is aware of the attack pattern that their character has, and pushes a simpler play as you wouldn't need to focus on such larger chains to keep up with your opponent. However, this doesn't mean that short chains are automatically the better option all the time, as your opponent can be quite effective in clearing out whatever drops you dish out, if they have a good read on your character's pattern. On top of this, you can quickly be overwhelmed with a long chain if you spend too much time spacing the seconds apart that trigger two chains to continue throwing out small chain combos. Or worse yet, if your opponent reaches quota before you, it's easy to become distracted when creating combos in Magical Drop, only to discover your opponent hit the quota first. Long chains can be pretty effective in overwhelming an opponent who is already losing, as it can quickly cause their board to be full. So if you are going on the offensive, it's good to maintain small chains until you feel confident a long chain can help you reach victory. The sheer benefit of doing these small chains is the fact that you are dropping the balloons far quicker and with less of them that your opponent can use against you. So overall, it's a key strategy to higher level play, like how building stack patterns is in Poyo Poyo. So this being the third game in the series, Data East has further expanded the universe and story of Magical Drop. A new tournament is being held for the Magical Drop themselves, and the victor who is awarded them may be granted a wish for their desire. So the premise is more or less similar, if not the same, as the second game before, but with the added fortune as the final boss of the game. Another cool change is that the characters finally have dialogue between them right before the battle begins. And this is different for every character, all depending on who they run into during the story mode. In addition to this, all 23 characters have their own endings as well, just like the second game. However, also like the second game, the localization again removes the majority of the story content of the game, as well as game content in general though they at least removed less of the game this time around compared to Magical Drop 2, with instead some alterations regarding difficulty and leaving the opening cutscenes and ending scene that has nothing to do with your selected character. But the total removal of the character endings and their dialogue to each other is a huge knock against the international version of the game. The most is time for Magical Drop 3 are the Story Mode, renamed Challenge Mode, the Survival Mode, and lastly a new Adventure Mode, which has seemingly replaced the puzzle mode of previous games. This is fine, though this is where the localization removed the hard difficulty from the challenge mode and altered the adventure mode to be far easier. So going down the list here, survival mode is very much like it was in Magical Drop 2, even including its label as the puzzle mode right next to its survival mode label in the menu. The arrow balloons, ice balloons, rainbow balloons, and bubble balloons return in this mode, all working just like they had before, but with the addition of a really annoying balloon that is the number block. And this thing absolutely sucks. It's a block that has a number indicating how many chains you need for it to clear, which from my experience is pretty annoying because it puts you in a position to instead play the game like a more traditional puzzler, arranging the balloons to properly line up multiple chains. Most of the time they aren't too bad, 
but sometimes they can drop with an absurdly high number. And none of the balloons are set up in a manner for you to realistically sight read and rearrange everything in time. Luckily, the number doesn't mean you need to do that many chains in a row, just that many in general. As it will count down with each chain achieved. But I am not a fan of these because it slows the game down. I guess conceptually, yes, it's a puzzle mode with that. But with the survival element adding pressure as the balloons drop every few seconds, it can just get frustrating. Visually, we now have a little chibi version of your selected character, who's in the background going on a nice stroll as you frantically try to survive as long as you can, in a seemingly never-ending line after line war against the dropping balloons. However, I should mention the character pool within this mode is far more limited than the challenge or versus options within the game. Only having the Fool, the High Priestess, the Emperor, the Lovers, the Chariot, Daughter Strength, Justice, and the Star as playable characters. But the mode itself is overall the same as it was in Magical Drop 2. Challenge mode, now being the main story mode, is where all 23 characters are playable, though the game only has 16 of them playable off the bat. The rest of the characters are unlocked via a cheat code like the previous game. And many of these secret characters, if not all of them, are far more powerful due to their drop patterns. Those secret characters being the Hangman, the Moon, the Hermit, Fortune, Tower, and lastly Temperance. You can also even play the characters Player 2 Color by selecting them with the Arcade's B button instead of the usual A button. Challenge is set up again like previous games but with some additional twists. Depending on the difficulty you select, you will be provided a predetermined path of characters to battle against with different difficulties adjusting how many battles you have. If you are playing really well, taking down your opponents quickly and without losing, you will have different battles compared to if you are taking a lot longer to win. For example, on the easy difficulty you have 6 predetermined battles, and after the first battle with the Fool, there will be a split between battling either the Magician or battling the High Priestess. The battle you will have next will be decided based on how quickly you eliminated your opponent. Winning the battle under 40 seconds will grant you a fight with the Magician, and winning a battle over 40 seconds will grant you a fight with the High Priestess. On the normal and hard difficulties, you instead have 12 battles total, with multiple splits towards the end. Meaning you could have a drastically different string of characters you fight against when playing the challenge mode over and over. On top of this, three encounters in the game are triggered in a totally different way. The Moon, the Hangman, and Black Pierrot. If you are on the path with the Moon, which is on one side, you can trigger the fight by reaching her in under 90 seconds. That means six battles ending with the Hermit. The Hangman fight on the other side can be triggered if you spend over 300 seconds with those same six battles. However, his fight won't trigger at all if you had fought the Fool earlier before him. Lastly, the uber powerful Black Hero can be fought after stage 10 of the challenge mode if you manage to reach him with at least 3 battles won in a row on top of having a score of 150,000. And keep in mind losing a match before reaching him resets your streak of 1 matches. Another interesting twist to the challenge mode is that the game will increase in difficulty every time you win and decrease every time you lose. Which makes clearing the game without losing at all sometimes impossible. As your opponent just teleports around their balloons. These changes make the challenge mode the best version of the story mode yet, being highly replayable due to the systems in place that add variety for multiple runs through it. On top of every character having their own ending and the many lines of dialogue they have with each other in each encounter. It's very fun to see what combination of battles you end up with based on your performance, and seeing just how far you can push your skills. Though Black Pierrot is most assuredly a secret boss for me, because I did not have the skill to reach him with my many attempts. The challenge of the game going up a level with each win really makes it tough to stay on top, and when you lose it does go down, but only by that same amount. Meaning you may have to lose multiple times before it starts to really feel easier due to how much further you are in the mode. One tiny neat detail though that applies to all the modes, is that the background shown when playing the game as the battles go on will change depending on what character you are playing against or what character is chosen first during a versus match, which I thought was pretty cool. Lastly, we have the new adventure mode that has replaced the previous game's puzzle mode. In this mode, you select from the same limited pool of characters from survival mode, and are tasked with moving through a game board of sorts, though it's less of a game board and more of a string of challenges with multiple paths. 
The story encompassing this mode is that all the selectable characters have a reason to reach the Empress first, and each of them have a different reason for doing so. For example, the Chariot is trying to get his cape back, as the Empress seemingly gave Father Strength his cape to use as a... loincloth? Sumo gear? Underwear, basically. When it's your turn, you are presented with a challenge you need to complete. The challenges here primarily deal with having to clear drops of balloons within the time limit, similar to survival mode. It also introduces a new item to the gameplay screen, a new fire bubble balloon, as well as the figurative wall that is the number blocks. The fire balloon is what you will need to move through the board, as the more fire balloons you collect, the higher number of spaces you'll get to move after you complete the challenge. You can collect these by squishing them just like a bubble balloon, but you have to be quick, as after some time they will become ice balloons that just get in your way. Losing the challenge will get you a game over, but you can retry with a credit. There are multiple types of spaces in this mode. The main blank space will simply give you a challenge you must complete to determine the number of spaces you will move. The other spaces on the board are a star, skull, and question mark spaces. Star spaces have goodies after the challenge, granting a beneficial item that can move you forward more spaces. Skull spaces will normally have items that move you backwards. And question mark spaces are just random, and even have a chance to give you some really bad items like the Krull that makes your next challenge more difficult as it mixes up the set balloon pattern of the challenge. Once you reach the Empress, you will have to battle her in a game of magical drop and if you defeat her, you win the game. The kicker here is you have three other opponents to contend with and if any of them reach the Empress before you do, you lose, getting a bad ending. If you happen to land on the same space as an opponent on the board, you will be granted the option to challenge them to a standard battle of magical drop. With winning the battle, eliminating that opponent from the game entirely. But it's a risk because if you lose, you will get a game over. If you want to challenge these CPUs, do it as soon as possible, as the further you are on the board, the tougher they will be when you challenge them. In the international version, they altered the game to instead have no opponents at all. Which is really weird, as it kind of transforms this mode into more of a practice mode, with challenges. But I guess if you are playing the modern re-release of Magical Drop 3, you can use this version to practice the board and what the spaces do before tackling the Japanese version to test your metal against the AI opponents. Well, just like Magical Drop 2 and Magical Drop 1, there were also console versions of the game. But this time, there were a lot more of them on a variety of different systems to play it on each with things worse or better than the arcade original. There was a Sega Saturn version released within the same year as the arcade and Neo Geo release, in 1997. This version makes a bunch of changes to the original being dubbed as a special version of the game. Like adding those other unique balloons like aero balloons and bubble balloons to the main game modes like challenge mode and versus mode. Along with having longer cutscenes and different progression within challenge mode. The game is also overall a bit slower than the arcade original due to these balloon changes, and therefore rebalanced as a result. There was also Magical Drop Pocket, released for the Neo Geo Pocket Color in 1999. This is an interesting version of Magical Drop 3, and this is also the first English version of the game to retain some story content from the arcade original. It has a far smaller character pool of about 8 characters. It contains 3 modes, a story mode, self-challenge mode, and a friend mode. The story mode isn't even a normal versus match, but instead a version of survival mode where your opponent is the one causing the line drops against you. But you at least still have an indication of what your opponent is doing from their animations. The English version of the game also has the character dialogue and endings, and some of the dialogue is pretty funny. Though the translation is pretty rough, with a lot of errors that make some conversations make no sense at all. The game is still solid as it retains the magical drop design, but lacks the ability to force a line drop with the press of a button. And the Neo Geo Pocket Color only has two buttons. Being the story mode on hard unlocks the Hangman, the Empress, and Fortune. But this was odd, as many reviews I found for the game stated there were no unlockables, which I assume just meant they hadn't attempted it. Self Challenge is just survival mode, but you have the wider space to manage the balloons like in the original. And I didn't have a means to check out the versus mode, but from what I understand, it's the same as story mode, but without the benefit of being able to see your opponent's board, only their character's animation. But that is not all. Another version of Magical Drop 3 was released on the Game Boy Color of all things, in the year 2000, 
and this version was only released in the US and European countries, as it was not made by a Japanese developer, nor even Data East. Similar to the Neo Geo Pocket Color version of the game, it has many limitations, but even more than even I expected. There is only a character pool of up to 8 characters, and the story mode is entirely missing. It only has the survival mode for single player. Yet it does have a 2 player mode that is closer to the arcade game. As unlike the Neo Geo Pocket Color version, both players boards are on screen, though apparently the frame rate performance suffers a bit. But I didn't have a mean to test any of this out, and I cannot find any footage or images of this 2 player mode. But from what I researched, this is still a solid 2 player version of the game. The arcade version was also ported to Windows and the Wii Virtual Console, just like Magical Drop 2. Lastly, there was also the PlayStation version, released in 1999, which not only included the Saturn's special version of the game, but also included an arcade version of the game, which replicates the original arcade game of Magical Drop 3 without having the special changes and rebalancing that the Saturn version introduced. So it's essentially a remastered port of the arcade original because it retains the visual upgrades that the Saturn version had, but maintains the arcade's balance and structure, right down to even having a timer to select your mode and character. So it has two versions of the game as well as a menu dedicated to an amazing gallery of art from the game, and even the game's development, like character drafts, promotional art, as well as a section that lets you see all the animations of every character in the game. Pretty damn neat. However, the awesome thing about the PlayStation version of Magical Drop 3 is that this is the version that was translated into English, retaining all the story content and modes of the game. That means all the character dialogue between battles, all of the endings, and all the difficulties that were missing in the arcade version are intact here. Though this version only released in European countries in the year 2000, and sadly removed the arcade remaster of the package, instead including a console port of Magical Drop plus one also translated into English. So it is a compilation of sorts that includes the special version of Magical Drop 3 from the Sega Saturn with the improved version of Magical Drop 1. The only downside to the English release of the PlayStation version is that since it was exclusive to European countries, the game itself had to be modified. If you didn't know, during the 90s and even early 2000s before HD TVs were the norm, CRT TVs in Europe ran at 50 Hz. The TVs in the US and Japan read at 60Hz. That meant games ported to Europe had to be adjusted to run at the speed of those 50Hz TVs. This means that if you were to play a game that was ported to Europe on any 60Hz TV or HD TV today, the game would noticeably have some type of speed issue, running too fast or running too slow, depending on the required modification needed for the port of the game. The music could have an altered pace too, or even have audio errors. In addition to that, 50Hz TVs also had a different resolution displaying meaning that playing a game from a different region will cause the game's image to misalign on a TV screen. Many people who imported games in the 90s to and from Europe had all kinds of tools and methods to try to get these games to run on the same hardware from different regions. But ultimately, there was no easy fix to the problem, as it was all dependent on the console and many times, especially on the PlayStation, the game itself. What this results in for Magical Drop 3 is the pace of the game being slowed down by about 16% with a few missing lines in the game's image when played on a 60Hz TV. It's a slight change but noticeable if you have played many hours of the Japanese version. For the PlayStation, many times Japanese games are what suffered most when being ported to Europe unfortunately. However, through emulation it's possible to play this version of Magical Drop 3 at its original speed, as well as many programs that can patch your physical copy to run on actual hardware. So whatever method you prefer, it's at least possible to play the game at its intended speed like the Japanese version. And it doesn't have crazy complications like other European version games ported from Japan. The PlayStation version is one I definitely enjoy playing the most between all the console ports of the arcade original. Although when it comes to whether I enjoy the PlayStation version or the arcade version more, it really comes down to a preference of sorts. As stated before, the PlayStation version comes with many changes and additions. Firstly, it has all the modes and difficulty intact, but the progression through Challenge Mode has been altered. So whatever path you are used to taking to reach Fortune in Challenge Mode has been changed a bit here. Though it seems that being quick or slow does adjust who I face during the battles. Visually, I think the PlayStation version just looks better. With better colors that seem to pop more, 
and of course there are far more effects going on on screen. It's also a much smoother experience running at 60 frames a second over the arcade version's 30 frames a second during battle. When it comes to the music, I like certain themes more from this version. But there are still some from the arcade original I definitely prefer. For example, I prefer the Empress's theme more in the arcade version. Well, I prefer Fortune's theme in the PlayStation version. If I am playing solo and wanting to watch the endings, I of course am going to be playing the European PlayStation version since it's all translated. And I don't really mind the slight speed reduction of the game if I am playing it with no patched alterations to its speed. Also, similar to the Neo Geo Pocket Color version, the character dialogue remains funny and entertaining. Just watching how all of these characters interact with each other and their endings is really fun. However, there is a downside to the translation. This game was localized by Swing Entertainment, and some of the translation can be a bit rough at times with the character dialogue between battles and sometimes with the endings and cutscenes. Another plus to the PlayStation version is characters are again just unlockable like the Super Famicom version of Magical Drop 2. As in just beating the normal difficulty one time will unlock all the secret characters instead of having to input a cheat code every time you're on the character select screen. But also, Black Pierrot is actually playable here, and he's unlocked once you actually manage to beat him in the challenge mode. And this was the only version of Magical Drop 3 I was even able to face him. There is one fundamental change to the mechanics in this version. This being the special console version of the PlayStation package. And it's that you now have a second or so longer to chain balloons between each other, so it is much easier to achieve a higher number of chains compared to the arcade original, or the arcade remaster this package includes. It's not really a negative or a positive, as the challenge mode already has the other balloons in the battles like arrow balloons or bubble balloons, but it's something to note. Characters also have some of these special balloons as part of them. Judgment, for example, can have arrow balloons to take advantage of, which again makes sense the rebalancing of the roster and game speed in general. However, when it comes to playing two player versus, it can be hard deciding what version fits best. And it's going to come down to how you and your friends prefer to play the game. In the standard versus mode on the PlayStation version, like I had just mentioned, you will have those extra balloons that are normally reserved for the survival and adventure modes here, that can show up more or less depending on what character you are playing as. But what is cool is that the adventure mode has a one-on-one -on -one player versus player setting. And I found that to be the best way to play the adventure mode because playing it single player in this version oddly only gives you just one opponent. Speaking of adventure mode though, that's not the only change. As now you move across the board by rolling a die and you now have to gather a certain amount of coins along with reaching the end of the board in order to win. The spaces on the board also now have a roulette of sorts to give items that can either be helpful or harmful to your progress on the board, like speeding you up, slowing you down, or even robbing you of coins. The challenges are also more interesting as you can have ones that make your balloons gas balloons, making them slowly drop, or hard balloons that make them super fast to drop. It actually feels more like a board game, instead of the arcade version's string of challenges to get further and further along to the goal. I do not recommend the arcade remastered version of this mode though, as there is an absurd amount of loading times between every move you do. All of this is to say though, if I am just playing the game casually or with friends. The new elements of balloons added to the PlayStation version I feel bring with it more ways for you to approach bursting balloons, which also adds some chaos and some overall fun to the core gameplay. But if I wanted to play it more seriously, and say even at a competitive level, then the arcade version is what I'll be playing. Whether that is practice or against an actual opponent, this is the version you will play and will find when people organize tournaments at locations or even online. And it's also the most available version to anyone interested in participating or wanting to play the game in general. That's right! 
there's actually a competitive scene in Magical Drop 3, and one which is still ongoing today that anyone interested in could be a part of. Hello everybody, I am Lord Jimmy Bones, joining me with Multiball, and we're here for this Magical Drop 3 here at Tapper Drive. Oh yeah, I am excited. Yeah. The game is best three of uh, is best of three rounds. Yeah, best of three rounds. And Set best of, of five games. Yes, yeah. best of five. First of three. There you go. But the idea is that uh, there's a coin flip to see who picks character first, and then you play a mirror match. Okay. Just and to, then just to uh, yeah. avoid counterpicks and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. So that means that technically no characters are banned. Oh. But any character you you pick, you have to play against oh, too. Okay. So what's about? What so. Uh, for obvious reasons, this character is known by uh, fans of the game as Jugs. So Jugs is a is a fairly mid-tier character. She just like pushes garbage down the center. She doesn't have any like special color pattern. Oh my goodness. Yes, it's definitely looking to me like Kyobi is is definitely playing a bit ahead. In general, his board is a uh, is a little lower. He tends to he tends to combo a bit harder. Oh, this game is pretty close. We got both at 30. Yeah, but you see Sarah's board isn't quite as good. He's cleaning it up a little now. Uh-huh. Oh, boy. Yeah, but you see, Kyobi's doing a good job of just milling through all of his pieces, which at the same time is making sure that Sarah oh, has fuck. to deal with a bunch of garbage. Oh, we got oh, okay. It was, oh, yeah. It was so close. It was like five left for uh, Sarah. Yeah. And, uh, just in time, you know, Kyobi with the yeah, zero. So, Damn. So, like, that's just one pop or, like, one combo. So that so, was the first game, right? Yeah, so that that was a nail biter. Yeah. Game one goes to Kyobi. Um, so how do you feel about playing those two players? So oh, now, do, uh, you, do you have a different strategy um, compared to you? How you play? Are they? Are you guys playing similar or just like? So Kyobi, I've noticed usually like plays fast like I do. Uh -huh. Like he just go like he just goes to clear as much of the quota as he can as possible. Multi ball definitely has a combo game down. Uh -huh. Well. Okay. And that makes certain characters particularly dangerous. Like Death has uh, Death has some very, very difficult to deal with color formations, as well as the drop pattern that she has. So she's very well suited for and she's very well suited for that combo play. Wow, ball is... setting up for a four, yep. five, six, six seven. seven. Yeah, there we go. Oh, my goodness. As you saw, tournament rules actually do mirror matches, where both players play as the same character. An interesting change to maintain an even playing field at all costs. And while it's not a hard rule, as some tournaments don't require it or even use it, it's something you will most often see when checking out tournaments for the game. This is due to the balance of the characters being determined over the years, with secret characters being pretty powerful in the meta of the game. Shame it doesn't have that custom mode from the Super Famicom version of Magical Drop 2. But regardless, it's an understandable rule. Both participants have to agree on a character for the first round, and normally the Magician is the default character if there is no agreement. The loser of the first match gets to choose the character for the next round, and you cannot pick the same character you won with again unless your opponent agrees to it. The first to win three rounds is the victor, and each round is five games along with the quota being set to 200, which are all settings that can be altered in the arcade game. Competitive tournament matches of Magical Drop 3 are quite a fascinating rush to watch as you see two players going at it with insane speed and pinpoint precision, much like the Rubik's Cube tournaments I had mentioned back in the introduction. Tests of skill on an even playing field as both players try to outplay the other. Knowing the character and their pattern is paramount for success. But as you saw, some players do better taking a pattern reading long chain approach over a small chain speed focused approach. So multiple styles of play are being represented here. It's exciting to see. Overall, I love Magical Drop 3, both its arcade and PlayStation versions. Magical Drop 3 is the versus puzzler that show me just how different and exciting a puzzle game can be, with its sheer intensity and focus that it demands from the player. The story mode is a lot of fun, and the fact that all characters have endings to them and tons of funny dialogue towards each other keeps me coming back for more beyond the compelling gameplay's design. The adventure mode is a nice change of pace to mix up the game and survival mode is there for anyone interested in that solo challenge. The gameplay here is at its peak, and it makes for a timeless experience that will continue to be enjoyable as the years continue to move forward. I highly recommend picking it up yourself and giving it a shot. You won't be disappointed if you have any interest in the puzzler genre at all, and it's a very beginner friendly game too, able to ease anyone with its easier difficulties and side modes. Hell, 
The easy difficulty in challenge mode even plays a tip for you after every one of its matches. I want to see more people get into it, because maybe, just maybe, we can have a community large enough to spark a sequel of some sorts for the modern age. I say that, totally ignoring the sequels that came after this though. Magical Drop F and Magical Drop 5. Two entries that will attempt to evolve the series further. But those games are for another video. Which means, the next video in this series, I'll be covering Magical Drop F, Data East's final game before closing down entirely. Hope to see you all there. Let me know what you thought of the video with a like or a dislike, and subscribe and hit the bell to get notified for when the next part of this series drops. You can also follow me on Twitter for those same updates along with anything else in my mind. Link for that is in the video description. And with that, I'm Timmy Tryhard, and I'm out. Bye.